Access more. Well, hello and welcome. Welcome to Hey, It's the Lescos. Episode so, number 63. 63. We're so glad that you're here with us today, um, that you take some time and turn on your device and listen to us. That is a great, <laughs> great story. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, what are we going to do with ourselves? Uh, here's no, what we're going to do. The question is, what are you going to do with me? Yeah, I love you so much, Jenny. Uh, <laughs> and thank you for listening. We have today a, here's what you're going to listen to. You're going to listen to us have a first double date with a couple. It's true. That's exactly what those, it was a wonderful first date. Yeah. Uh, John Mark and I, uh, we, have, we have John Mark and Tammy, Cammy, Tammy Comer on the podcast today. <laughs> Uh, some amazing people. John Mark's written some books you know, um, no doubt. Uh, Tammy, his wife, had never been on a podcast with him before. So that first was a time. really big first yeah. for him, for her to come on. And she's amazing. Yeah, she's so sweet. And them together is hilarious. The <laughs> dynamic, so fun. Um, and we had never spoken to Tammy and Jenny had never met John Mark. I had known John yeah, Mark from a distance. a lot of unknowns. We text a ton. And yep. Uh, well, not not even a ton. We text some, uh, but I really like John Mark from a distance, and I've appreciated and respected uh, what he's led, how he's led his books. Uh, we're very different, but very similar in some ways too. Mm-hmm. And so, to sit down all four of us together and have this conversation, it was very fun. And uh, it was a blind first double date. It was a blind first double date, and I def I don't know about them. They may be blocking my number from their phones right now, but I <laughs> I, I enjoyed that that I conversation too. immensely. Yeah, it was great. It was really fun. <laughs> John Mark has a new book out called Live No Lies. We get to it at the very end, so stay tuned. I always, when I hear when I hear the title of it, I keep thinking, dead men tell no tales. That <laughs> is what you think of? That's what you go to? Because yeah. like live no lies, tell no tales. I just, I, I go there. I don't know why. It's very And weird. I like the voice too. <laughs> dead men tell no tales. <laughs> That's very good, Jenny. Well, I hope you have a lovely day, and I hope you enjoy this conversation with John Mark and Tammy Comer. That's like a tongue twister. Mm -hmm. Live no lies, Tammy Comer. All right, here it goes. Well, John Mark and Tammy Comer, thank you for being on Hey, It's the Lust Ghost. Fantastic. Thanks for having us. Happy to be here. <laughs> this is that awkward, like two person podcast? Who says, well, hey, who says great to be on? We didn't plan that one out. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Look what beautiful smiles you guys have. You guys obviously, uh, right off the bat, have a good dentist, good toothpaste situation going on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to mom and dad for the orthodontist. I know, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You guys have a toothpaste you can recommend? Uh, <laughs> oh gosh. Because I'm serious. I'm talking about is like it, Hollywood. Is that, is that a political plus. question? Isn't that become like <laughs> it's an emotionally loaded question now? Like, do you? Well, use I'm going to guess. I'm going to venture a guess. Yeah. You guys are Portland people, so Tom's feels on brand, but uh, but I would also say I wouldn't put it past you guys to like make your own ethically sourced, you know, <laughs> toothpaste. Well, it's so like, I, I've tried, like I just recently tried another one of the like, I, I didn't even know that apparently deodorant is like cancer or something oh, yeah. really bad. Gosh. I don't even know. I don't aluminum. Even know, it's but the I, aluminum yeah, or something either. or other. Yeah. I read some things like, oh no, deodorants of the devil. So we, we <laughs> tried us and our kids tried like natural deodorant. Yeah, and that's not happening. It was, a dis- <laughs> it was just, we have middle schoolers now going through puberty. It was, it was a stinky couple of weeks at the wow. Comer house. Well, you just wonder what did they do? Like in the olden days in Bible times, like wherever was everyone just smelly? I think like, they just smelled that and, and put on some olive oil once in a while. <laughs> olive oil. Uh, there you go. Oh, but I'm waiting for the answer. I want to know the toothpaste brand. <laughs> oh man. Uh, yeah, I, I I got sucked. This is embarrassing. I got sucked into like an internet ad thing, which rarely, just for the record, rarely just happened to me. But I have like the Quip, you know? Oh yeah, so do I. Yeah. Yeah, and they you just, have that too. I, I do. Really, no one. I it, I did not think it worked good, but it works for you. Well, I, it's like a annual subscription, so now I'm committed. <laughs> You're I in know. a yeah. You 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 bit the bullet on a year. Well, it's and funny because Levi, it didn't work for Levi. We had it, and I didn't love it because I really like a water pick. I really like that. So 
having the water to floss with, and so they don't have that. So, so I, I still use the quip, but he doesn't. Couldn't stay. With I don't it. even know what a water pick is. I feel like those are so I feel like, undignified. I think you, you use a water pick because you're just like drooling well, while I feel you're like cleaning. Totally. You have put a lot more thought into brushing your teeth than the combers have. Mm. Well, a water pick's good. I've also had a lot of dental catastrophes. I lost a tooth to a zipper when I was in middle school. Oh my gosh. A friend in, swung a jacket at me and the logo was a Nike logo on the zipper pull and it shattered my front tooth. So I've had root canals oh. and multiple crowns and caps. And so I'm in the dentist pretty regularly. Recently, they told me to stop doing bleach whitening toothpaste because I didn't tell you this because the I, if I did it anymore, it would be whiter than the crown, which will not be changed by oh. that. So they're like, you need to stop. So anyhow, it's a thing. I'm, but the, the water pick is not classy, Tammy, in answer to your question. <laughs> Nobody looks cool with a water pick in their mouth. <laughs> but it is very satisfying, the, the feeling of that jet of water going between your teeth. And you had yeah. a good report this time. No cavities this last visit. I was very pleased. Well done. Well done. You guys yeah, have I'm lots gonna, of cavities? I'm planning to go Google water pick after this. <laughs> with a K. K. I don't, see, I don't like kidding. things that are misspelled on purpose. I never liked that. Like in youth ministry, it used to always be like, you would misspell stuff and it was edgy. Yeah, that we just dated ourselves as coming up in the 90s. One yes. on connection with an X. Yes, yes Gen exactly. X, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> now, did you guys start in youth ministry? I know you guys have up until recently led a church at the helm, but uh, did you guys start in youth ministry? Not really. Uh Kind of, though. I mean, kind of. My first job, I was one of six youth pastors at this like 10,000 person mega church. But my job was first through third grade. Aww. Not even kidding. So that was, that so was specific. My, so my oddly first. specific. Yeah. You know, you're a large church when you're like, you are the pastor for first through third grade. <laughs> uh, only A through L, though, not M through Z. <laughs> That's yeah. another guy. That's someone else entirely. <laughs> Exactly. And, and Z, we just don't talk about. Uh, so yeah, that was mine. And then I, we did um, young adults ministry for a long time. So we kind of went right from third graders to college students. Yeah. And we did that for a fair bit, but we went to the church really young. So um, yeah, married really young. Yeah. Really young. We didn't do a lot before planting, which I do not recommend. Okay, so this is uh, awesome, Tammy. By the way, uh, you told us right before this is the first time you guys have done a podcast together, so that makes us so happy yes. that the inaugural uh, voyage is here so on Hey Um We know I, John Mark, and I have known each other for a while. We text uh, occasionally, have been in person a few times. I do text you often on accident because someone on my staff's name is John Mark, <laughs> and so I apologize for that. <laughs> He's John Mark Creamer, and you're John Mark Comer, so there's been multiple. Oh, you're like, oh, I'm wow. so sorry, text. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know. I don't know any other. Other Levi Lesko's. That's a very, very, is that a real name? I, that, that sounds it's like real. a movie actor name. It does like, feel I'm a scared. little made up. It yeah, it's it's real. It's not by blood. My my stepdad's last name was Lesko. He adopted him. So it's a step, Czechoslovakian. Step Krampa. Step sorry, you're right. It's a, it's a Czechoslovakian name, but I am not Czechoslovakian. And so if I random do meet someone Czech, they're like super passionate, like, this is a great thing. And I'm like, I'm sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the real thing. Okay, so where I was going with that was, uh, yeah, so what age were you guys at when you got married then? 19 and 21. Yeah, her, her parents wanted me to be 21 <laughs> before we got married. And so we got married the first Saturday after my 21st birthday. Wow. Which... Tells you everything you need to know about my psychosis and my shadow <laughs> and uh, what's broken me that is a life of spiritual formation to grow out of. You towed the line and like barely, barely. That's awesome. That's so you guys great. got married young though too, yeah. right? Yeah, I was 22 and Levi was 21. And who's 19 and who's 21 here? I was 19. He was 21. Okay, yep. so you're slightly older. Yes, yeah, she's a little bit older than me. So very similar though, very young still figuring mm -hmm. stuff out. We were in youth ministry. Were you guys, had you guys already started the church yet when you got married or was you, was that with the first through third grade? No, no. Yep. That was first. That was, <laughs> uh, we graduated from third graders to college students at yeah. that point. Yeah. And was this at your dad's church show, Mark? Nope. This was, it's a long story, but uh, a mega church down in Southern Oregon that I was at for just a couple of years. Okay. And then how, how many years into the marriage did Bridgetown start? Kind of depends on how you. Um, uh, two, I think two years in. Yeah. Yeah, 2003. Got married in 
2001, two years. Wow. That's- well, until we started what became Bridgetown. Okay, maybe right. help, help, what, what, what's the qualification? What do you mean what started what became? That's a can of worms. It's a, it's a. I know, but it's really confusing for people if you just say 18 years, I feel like, because most of the, I mean, it's just, you started, we moved to Portland, started praying for church, started a small group, but eventually it was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a long, complex story. There's not like a, it's not a scandal. It's just a long, complex story. We were a part of a team that planted a church in the suburbs that grew crazy fast that then ended up planting multiple locations. Mm. And then for all sorts of reasons, philosophical and personal, we decided that was not what we wanted to pursue. So the locations all went autonomous. And so um, the church that we are at now that we just finished leading, we just passed off a week ago to a new lead pastor I mean, if you date it, I date it from 18 years ago, but it, yeah. you could date it from when that location started, which was 11 or 12 years yeah. ago, 12 yeah. years ago. So it's, I'm it's a very simple it's answer. It's nice lives, when people come to our know. church and they're like, you know, why don't you have this? I can be like, well, we're a church plant. We're still getting started. And if they're <laughs> yes. like, is this a trustworthy church? Like, We've been around for 18 years. So <laughs> know. You can kind of answer it. So either good. Yeah. That's real, man. So you mentioned you wouldn't recommend starting a church being newlyweds. Can you explain that a little bit? Mm. Yeah. I just think, you know, church planting, you have so much you have to learn Mm. and it's kind of when you start, I mean, obviously you're kind of the, you end up being worship leaders, people who are setting up the chairs, children's ministry, preacher, all the things, all the things. (laughs) And so when you don't really have, um, I think it was harder when we were really young to know even like what were healthy emotional limitations. And so um, we just way overexerted for way too And you years. had no kids back then, right? Because your oldest is 13. So He's you're able to- He's actually almost do- 16. Oh, yeah. okay. 15. Yeah, but for the first three years of the church, we had no kids and it yeah. was our life. It's all we did. And it was wonderful. It was so, it was great and felt like it was a good- I mean, it was really fun, but it's just... Yeah, I think we were really driven. There was a lot of ego and ambition. I wanted a lot in me, not in you, uh, but she's much more godly than I am. <laughs> but I There's wanted a lot of that going around. Mark. I mean, you know how it is. You know, you guys know this so well. Like, I mean, goodness, we will be judged not just for what we did, but for why we did it. And mm. with pastoral work... It is so dang easy to do really good things for really not good reasons. Yeah. And if I'm, hopefully I'm, you know, my motivations are more pure now than they were 20 years ago. But if I'm honest, I don't even know, nor do I think I want to know, like where in my heart the line is where I'm no longer serving the church, but in some twisted way, the church is serving me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and whether that's an identity or a sense of security or promotion for a book or some nonsense, you know, it's just so easy to uh, use the church rather than serve her. Mm-hmm. So I think there was a lot of that in us when we were young, which was, I think, our drive to plant so young, you know, was a, I think there's a lot of hubris kind of in me, not in her, but in me um, that was wrapped up in that, that life and failure and, um, you know, almost an early midlife crisis, nervous breakdown. Some of that stuff had to like, you know, kind of get out of our heart. Not that it's out now, but at least it's there. At least now I can see it more. I can see when that Mm -hmm. stuff, when those motivations come up in my heart, um, the church tradition we came out of, there was just very little even talk about that much less Mm -hmm. kind of honest self-examination of the heart motivation which is really tragic because it's the result of so much anxiety and anger. And, you know, whenever you need something from the people that you serve, you're incapable of leading them mm. and, uh, and loving them and without loving them strings attached without strings. Know? Yeah. So oh, if you need wow. money, if you need fame, if you need power, if you need affirmation, if you need to be liked, if you need to be cool, if you need whatever, it could be anything, then you will not actually pastor them. You will do something else. And then in a lot of ways, I think pastoring is parental and it's not, I mean, not technically, but 
but you want to lead out of a place of maturity and wisdom. Yeah. And it's really hard to have that when you're 19 and 21. <laughs> I, I mean, we oh, had no had children. What we do you have to tell we the didn't, world? Yeah. Like our career, I mean, everything was very <laughs> new and even our, you know, being married a couple of years, how do you give marriage advice, you know, except for just the very basics. I think a lot of the pastoral wisdom that has, you know, developed over the years was just experience. Yeah. You know, yeah. just from growing up. Yeah. I think well, a lot about like the monks, you know, for, because, and I, I thoroughly disagree with this, but because for almost a thousand years, you know, celibacy was tied to the priesthood and pastoring. The upside to that is it opened up all sorts of other options for how to do ministry. And, you know, in America, you kind of have the like, the path, not that everybody has this path, but of like go to Bible college, then you become a middle school pastor, then a high school pastor, <laughs> yeah. then a college pastor. Then if Easier you're super way, good, yeah. <laughs> you know, your church plan, otherwise you're an associate pastor. And then maybe you become, you know, it's like you work your way up the ladder. And that's not all bad. The upside mm -hmm. is by 30, you like, you know, the ins and outs of the mm -hmm. church in a really good way. You're, you're adept at kind of the, um, the skill set required for pastoring. But the downside is you just, I mean, what do you have to offer the world at a maturity level at a, so the monks would basically, after they, you know, came of age, would join a monastery. They'd spend about 20 years. They'd spend, it's okay. <laughs> Sorry, there's a weird sound. <laughs> a weird is, sound. That's on our end. I think it's on there's, our end. There's some, Sorry. Something oh, happening okay. with the like is not your fault. They can edit it all out. So just, oh, okay. we'll Sorry, edit guys. that all out. <laughs> they can't edit it out. <laughs> What they can't edit out is you doing that. Stuff. Oh, sorry. So <laughs> just no one we want to happen. Just kidding. That was They'll it. stop us yeah. if it's anything that is okay. Cool. <laughs> sorry. Wow. My bad. I totally. love it. Oh, so much. So great. Uh, so it great. is really a weird sound. Just I know. Way. So sorry. That's our fault. It's so sorry. Us. We'll try and keep no, it under no, control. It's, it's fine. It's all good. This happens a lot. Sometimes it's like the iPad will die, and you'll just have to keep looking and like totally. pretending like you can and see the person. You have okay. any idea what they look like, or <laughs> okay. Sometimes like I my, don't know these things. The one I did before this, the microphone died in the middle of me giving a really good feel. So I, but I could tell it was working on their end. So I just oh, kept going on my end till I got it. done. I was like. Pause. <laughs> okay. Oh. The struggle. But, um, you know, in the, the monks would basically come of age and then they would join a monastery and they would basically pray, live in community and work on their craft with their Abba or their Ama and basically grow and mature to a self-aware place of maturity. Mm -hmm. And then 20 years in, they would then come back to the city and become a deacon or a bishop or they would then pastor a church almost like in the second half of life mm -hmm. now that they were like full of spiritual power. So obviously when you have, you know, a marriage and this is different than our Western kind of capitalistic yeah. based system, but there's a, there's a wisdom principle there that I think we have to figure out something around. Some good stuff in there. Yeah, How much of that though, do you think Joe Mark is part of just the process of maturing? You mentioned second half of life and seasons and, you know, part of what you're looking back on saying, this was all terrible. My motives were all askew. Some of that does come with the belly and the fire that it takes to launch something in that mm -hmm. season of life. Mm -hmm. And I think it can be easy to look back on yourself, you know, and ascribe that, that was all wrong and all the wrong motivation. But I guarantee you, when you were in the ages you're talking about, writing these sermons, getting up to talk, you had a heart to hurt to help people. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like all your motives were wrong. Mm -hmm. And there is there, there's a lot of mixed up, because I mean, it's so easy to look back and be like, I was such an idiot then because I don't know what I know now. But back then, the motives were pure, even if tainted. Hmm. But there does no. take some of that bravado to get anything off the ground, you know? True. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I would agree with that. It's a both and. I, I think yeah. about it through the lens of, um, have either of you guys read M. Scott Peck's The Road Less Traveled? It's a great book. Yeah, it's, no, one, of our, it's one of our mm -hmm. kind of top 10. Mm. Not a Christian book per se, but it's about character formation. Mm -hmm. He became a Christian later in life, actually, after he wrote that book. Anyway, he's a psychologist, dead now, but one of the best psychologists of the last century. Mm -hmm. And he writes about marriage and, you know, there's all the science now that explains the neurobiology, which is way over my pay grade. But of basically, when you get married or when you, when you meet someone, there's about a six to 24 month window of euphoric feelings 
that are a mix of like kind of emotional euphoria, mm-hmm. sexual desire that we call past that we call falling in love. Mm-hmm. And no matter who you are, like that plummets after about on average about two years, sometimes much less, sometimes a little bit longer. It depends on who you are. And he writes about how, and he's not even writing as a Christian, how, you know, marriage is the, the highest level of human self-actualization. Nothing will move you toward love. Nothing will grow you, mature you, forge you, form you, stretch you like marriage, but it's way harder than most people realize. So he writes about, you know, how, how this is like your body's way of getting you to make a lifelong commitment that you would never make if you actually knew how hard it was going to be. Wow. Yes. And, you know, so it's like God, you know, you, you can look at that through evolutionary biology, or you could just look at it through God wired the body to get us to like make the commitment that for, for very dubious reasons, mm-hmm. some of them are just like sexual attraction, desire, some of them are even narcissism. Like, I like how you make me feel and you like me too, but actually you're making the commitment that then if you stick with it, will actually set you free and form and mm-hmm. forge you into a person of self-giving love. So I think church planning is, I think ambition and church planning are, are similar. I think there's something in that youthful zeal that mm-hmm. is, is a mixed bag of motivations but I think if we actually knew how hard church planting was, I know I know I would never do it again. That's what I'm saying. That. You need some of that, <laughs> totally. some of that you need, and you, you maybe awareness. would never have done it yeah. if you didn't have a little bit of that cockiness, you know, or whatever you want to yes. describe it as. Yeah. Which That's only true. maybe it is a young man's game in that regard, you know, to just be dumb enough to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. My dad planted a church at 52 and it was a wonderful success. So. Wow. But I think for most people plant, you know, when they're young, but we planted way too young. So I'm, you know, there's a difference between planting at 30 and planting at 23. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Now you guys have some of the greatest children's names that, I mean, Sunday, Jude and Moses. Great name. <laughs> and that is that is a serious. You have serious naming chops there. By that's, the way, that's bi- that's very biblical. <laughs> what did Jim say? Oh, we had a friend who's who said to it. We said he was saying. So what? What names are you guys thinking? We said we. This I was pregnant. Our, this is for our second. Yeah, son. and I said, well, we're gonna name him Moses, and he goes, Moses. <laughs> Moses, why didn't you just name him Jesus? And I was like, oh gosh. He's like, those are some big shoes to fill. And I was like, yeah, it's true. It's true. But, you know, I mean, we've I've met some Jesuses in my day. It's it's hey, not like that doesn't get done. It's my dad's middle name. So yeah. you know. There you go. That's so great. And you said your oldest is turning 16? Yeah, in October. Oh, mm-hmm. our oldest is turning 16 in October. Yeah, too. I was gonna say we have a pretty Hi. similar link. 16, we have a 12 and we have a nine. So we're not too far off in the. Oh, yeah. Wow. Then, really yeah. The four. And then Linya would be 14. Yeah. Uh, so she's right in there. And then we have a four year old. So you guys tapped out. We just kept wow. going. We <laughs> almost did that a couple of years ago and we got a dog instead. I was just going to say, but our dog changed that. <laughs> oh my God. You may have made the right choice. We like Lennox very much, but on some we, days, you know. We can leave ours in the crate. Um, so, so we came really <laughs> close. We knew some rad. Families yeah. that had four kids and had them later in life. And, you know, I read all the research on how, you know, children um, become more altruistic, well adjusted, mm-hmm. less neurotic, successful adults, and it increases with each child till four. Then it plateaus and at seven, it declines. So <laughs> by having four, <laughs> by wow. having four children, they're, they're going to turn out better than if you had three. So yeah. it is funny. The dog is like, gets us a 0. 0.5. Yeah, that, totally, that is totally. Jenny's, Jenny's one of eight, by the way. So she's the first oh, of wow. eight. Yes. Really? I'm one of five. So we both, we, with our four children that we still have, it's, both of our families are like, wow, maybe, maybe you could have tried harder, you know, under yeah. achievers. Yeah, just kind of slack just one of these like new narcissistic millennial couples. Yeah. You but know? you exactly. do tend to feel a bit like we sometimes feel like we're more like grandparents to Lennox. It's mm-hmm. almost like church planning at 50. We're like yes. we're a little bit more permissive. It you know, it takes a lot more going on for us to be really worried. You know, we're like, it's is he'll be fine. Oh. Yeah, I'm the oldest of four, and my little, the youngest is my brother. He's 12 years younger than me, and man, it was like all like they were so hard on me. And by him, it was just like, yeah, whatever you want. I mean, it's like I had to buy my own car, work two jobs the summer after my sophomore year, buy my own car, pay my own health insurance, buy my by my brother. They literally bought him a car, paid for his car insurance. Oh my gosh. I was like, that is so this is real. not fair, young man. This is not <laughs> yeah. fair. 
That's so real. Man. Now you mentioned it uh, in passing and we can come back to parenting because you guys are incredible uh, watching you lead from a distance. Uh, I mean, you might you beat your kids at home for all I know, but I mean, from, from the internet, <laughs> you seem like yeah. incredible Very parents. Accurate. Well, the internet, the internet is internet. really yeah. accurate about yeah. family life. Just it's keep just it there. Just keep it. All the really photos you post. Really accurate vision of what our family is like. Uh, but I was going to say, uh, you mentioned uh, after 18 years, uh, you guys have made the just as a week ago, made the transition out of the church. I can't imagine the mixed bag of emotions, both the sadness and then probably in this last 20 months, some euphoria to be mm-hmm. uh, not in that anymore. Uh, so maybe just kind of walk us through uh, what what that's, what that journey has been like. Because I, from what I understand, this the seeds for it were there before the pandemic. This is not a this is too hard. We're out of here. This is a sense of calling and purpose mm-hmm. and redirection for this next season of life. Wow. Yep, absolutely. And um, as of now, we're not leaving the church. We're just no longer in that role of lead pastor. Mm-hmm. Step down from that. Still in the community, though, we're about to go on a nice long sabbatical. Nice. Yeah, and it's been a long time coming, about a decade coming. Um, uh, really seriously, eight years ago, we went on our last sabbatical. We were supposed to have one. Uh, we, we have a sabbatical every seven years. We were supposed to have one last summer, uh, but instead our city was on fire with the riots of 2020. And there was just no, between COVID, there's no possible way to go away and rest. So it was delayed a year and a half almost. So it's been a, it's been a long, hard year. But on our last sabbatical eight years ago, we almost did not come back. Um, we had been a part of this mega church. It had grown really fast. I had grown disillusioned with certain aspects of that, but more just with my own personality, just realizing, oh, well, I don't think I'm actually well suited to be a mega church pastor or maybe even a lead pastor. I'm more introverted. I'm more of a teacher. I love to write. I love spiritual direction. Both of us love kind of sitting one on one with people. Mm-hmm. And as you know, Levi, you're a great leader. There's just a ton that goes into like filling that role. Even if you have a team, like there's just, so at the end of the day, that point leader position is kind of all consuming. Yeah. So um, I felt like a failure as a leader. I felt like I had no business being a lead pastor of a church. I'd done it way too much, way too young. And uh, I'm sure some of that was, I was hard on myself, but I felt like a failure. We almost quit. We had an opportunity to go take this teaching <laughs> pastor job in California. We're from California. I wanted to mm. move back to the sun. It was like, this is it. This is our, this is our ticket out. Yeah. But we just did not mm. feel a release from the spirit. Um, and our community basically said, no, we do, were big believers in like communal discernment. They basically said, no, you cannot go. You're not done here. And they said, you know, if you leave now, you'll walk with, the, you'll lead out of a limp the rest of your life. You'll lead out of a wound. And the only way you'll heal is by coming back and leading again, but in a little bit of a different way with some different people. Mm. So that was some of the best advice anybody ever gave us. We came back, we changed a ton about, of our, about, about our life. That's where that book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry came out of that whole season of our life. It was Beautiful. really sweet, hard season, but really mm-hmm. good yeah. season. And, um, but that desire to kind of move out of a lead pastor role into a teaching pastor role, still love the church, still want to pastor, want to serve the church, just want to give myself more to what I think I'm best at. Um, that desire has just gone up over the last eight years. And when COVID hit, you know, we're really healthy relationships with our elders and our leaders. We're able just to talk really openly. We've been praying about this for years. And basically their thought was, Man, if, if you, we know that you're going to make a transition at some point out of the lead role, there's probably not going to be a better time than the backside of COVID for all sorts of different reasons. You're going to lead stronger through COVID than you ever have since you planted. And I was more present than I ever have been. And uh, half the church has moved out of the city and moved away and people have changed yeah. jobs. And it's going to be like replanting a church almost anyway. And it's going to require some, some different kind of leadership as we go forward and the church needs to really grow in some new areas. And so there are all sorts of reasons that made us think as a group, as a team, like, Hey, if this is going to happen, probably there's not going to be better time than fall 22, 21. So here we are. So good. Now, Tammy, what was your perspective? Because John Mark, we've heard your side of that obviously here now, but also you open up your book, the ruthless, the ruthless elimination of hurry with that story the anxiety, the intensity, <clears throat> all of that. That book's amazing, by the way. Mm. I love as well, um, 
God Has a Name, which I think is your third book. Is that right? Uh, uh, the relationship one, the anxiety fourth, one. Yes. Fourth? What was yes. your first one? I self-published a little memoir that's out of print now on purpose. Okay. So that one had not heard about. I knew the, awesome. I knew the loveology, yeah. the anxiety one. And then, but the first one I read of yours and how I was really introduced to you uh, after we had met in Chicago at that breakfast yes. uh, was the God Has a Name book, which I read on a vacation and loved. And I really enjoyed your writing style. I do enjoy your writing style. You do a real fun thing with your books. Um, and I don't even know how to describe it. It's just your paragraph choices are very quirky and <laughs> and and like it's almost like um it's just funny. You stab at words and sentences and paragraphs. Do you have a intentionality in that or is that just your the, the way you kind of you you frame it because it's very unique. Hmm. Um you know, I just I came of age in a time when uh barely anybody's reading books anymore. People are, are re- statistically people read more than ever, but they read their news app. They read Instagram. You know, mm. they don't long form book reading is all in decline, um, even as more books are being written now than ever before. So it's just a weird time to work as a writer, you know? Yeah. So, no, I basically just structure my books the way that a blog is structured. So kind of all left aligned, short sentences. And I want it to feel kind of like a animated conversation. I mean, it's not, I put, you know, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of hours into a book as you sure. know very well. <laughs> yes. both, both of you know very well. It's, it's not a conversation. <laughs> a lot has gone into that. Yeah. But I want it to kind of feel like you're sitting with me for a, an animated conversation over a cup of coffee, you know, yeah. so strong kind of voice um, for better or for worse. That's just, yeah. I like it. I like yeah, it. It's, well, it's very unique and reading it has a different flow. And specifically with God has a name. I love the squiggles throughout and the mm-hmm. abstract art and, very fun. Um, but yeah, you share in Ruth, the ruthless elimination of hurry, uh, that side of story. I would just be curious, Tammy, to hear that from your perspective. Mm-hmm. Was it jointly you both were going through that panic and anxiety or were you watching him mm-hmm. go through that? Just curious. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say, I, I mean, I was watching him go through it and we're, and I was processing with him through it. Um, you mean when he, what what part are you? Well, saying? he sort of describes. He opens that book up dramatically with a nervous breakdown yeah, and all yeah. that. I'm just curious, was how much of that was shared by you, and how much of that were you like, hey, how do I help my husband? He's kind of losing his mind here. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think we just walked it together. I was watching the whole process with him and walking through it. But I think, um, I feel like the ruthless elimination of hurry does help explain like his the whole process of how it all happened. Um, but it, it, for us, it, it dramatically shifted. I would say before, before it, there was like a before and kind of an after. And I feel like that almost like breakdown when we didn't come back and we, when we did come back, there were new boundaries with which we wanted to do our life. It was like Mm -hmm. the life we had been living was not sustainable. It wasn't healthy. Um, and I just, I, I felt like we were, we were losing him and, mm-hmm. you know, it was like, gosh, this is just not, this is not his best self. You can't run without, you know, limits. So anyway, yeah, I, I mean, I would say we definitely were in it together. We processed it all together. Um, I, would, I guess what I mean is, I mean, how much of that were you personally going feeling? through that too? To, yeah. Like was. I realize obviously you're doing it together, but was that, were, well, you, were you breaking down too is what I'm trying to say? You might want to let him in. So we're polar opposite yeah. personalities. At, at, like basically <laughs> any any metric you can think of, we're basically the opposite. Where are you guys at on the Enneagram? So, oh, I'm, I'm, I hate the Enneagram right now. But you can still tell them. Uh, no, I no longer publicly oh, identify uh, as anything. It would be off oh, brand for him to support God. it. <laughs> oh my god! I like that, and I want. We'll have to come back to that. Explain that, but <laughs> but let's just start with what That's the test says. You are. I'm a nine. Don't, don't get me. Oh wow! Me. Jenny's oh, a nine wow. too. Tammy. Oh, oh see. nines are the best. <laughs> well, women. John Mark is not a nine. I'm gonna guess <laughs> one. <laughs> I cannot confirm nor deny that you are. Uh, you have the spiritual gift of discernment at some yeah, point. There yeah, there we go. Okay, so I'm his, I'm his textbook of a three as you're likely to meet today. Oh, crush <laughs> it. Well done. 
Yeah, there we go. Until it's not so good. But <laughs> but t- what do you yeah, mean by my, not? My, my point was just we're opposite personalities. She is so grounded. Uh, I'm like the neurotic, high strung, melancholy, mental illness runs in my family. I have multiple kind of non neurotypical things about me, you know, obsessive compulsive stuff. And um, she is just calm, grounded, joyful, really down to earth, like just the opposite of neurotic. Mm -hmm. So I think we went through that season together very differently. Yeah. But a big part of our story that is a whole long conversation is we've been living uh, with her under chronic illness for a lot of years for 15 Mm -hmm. years uh to the point where we thought she was dying a couple of years ago we're making plans for me to be a single dad and then she was uh dramatically delivered from a demonic generational curse last fall my whole life is totally different so that's a side part of the story that doesn't make it into the book and stuff is basically my wife was extremely unwell yeah. through that whole thing, um, which is just a whole thing. Yeah. Wow. Which makes it probably no doubt very challenging for you to be there to support him in the way that you would even want to mm-hmm. when you're having a hard time hanging in there yourself due to a different battle. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think I'd been sick for so long. It didn't even like, it was just like, this is our normal at mm-hmm. that point in time. Um, but it did create limitations for me for sure as far as like how to engage with him um so i mean yeah i i think during that season community was like i was really i think i was nervous about us not having like community and we learned community through being isolated for a lot of years early on in ministry mm-hmm. and um so anyway with this new passing of the baton um, with Bridgetown, it's been such a different experience than when we, he wrote Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, because I don't know, I just feel like we have, I'm healthy this time. Um, and also back then I just, um, I just felt, I don't, I didn't quite know. I didn't quite know like how I was still felt young and we had young children And I didn't, it was really tricky. Like with my sickness, it was really hard to gauge how I would age honestly. And like what our future would look like. So anytime we were, John Mark was stressed about his present or over overwhelmed. It was hard to gauge if I could be, I might be really good and and be in a good season and be really present to him. Or I might be kind of like partially bedridden or, you know, really cognitively impaired um, yeah, so it was a complex experience, yeah. but I mean, I don't know. I mean, what would you it's say? A lot. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's a lot. And being in the midst of in ministry and having the kids, I feel like even ki- kids when they're young, cause gosh, they would have been eight and five or something at that point, or like, that's hard. That's a hard time when you're trying to lead and love and parent in the midst of your own struggles. And that's kind of even going back to being a church planner when you're young. It's like, we're trying to parent and lead wisely, but yeah. we're, we don't even know what we're doing in our lives. Yeah. It's like, we're it's just, trying to get the kids to school and yes, survive yeah. Yeah, puberty and all the oh, things. Oh gosh, yeah. you guys. Being kids, wow. having kids. Yeah. Uh, man. And so so how how how's the entrance into high school going for you guys and and all the all the teenage stuff? Your oldest is a girl, right? Yes. Yep. Olivia she's she'll be sixteen is, this month. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So she's sophomore. Ears. Sophomore. Yeah. What sophomore. what advice do you have for us? Give us give us the wisdom. <laughs> give us the we're you know we're in a city and so almost nobody has kids our age. Yeah. Almost all of our friends have kids that are like a solid decade younger, mm-hmm. just because the urban dynamics and cost of living and just what it's like to live in the city. And so they probably all moved to Beaverton by the time they do have kids your exactly. age. Exactly. Yeah, then yeah. they have kids and they move away. So, um, <laughs> so they can buy a house. So yeah, we're like just this quirky, random, like Christian homeschool family in the middle of a city that had kids. <laughs> even. So yeah, what? Well, anyway, we, what we don't have any advice. We would, our parenting book is scheduled for uh, 2080. That's when we're going to write that. 
Uh, but we have great kids, and yeah. they are surviving us very well so far. Um, and the 16-year-old who uh, is our oldest is incredible. She, We did homeschool for a while, and then she made the decision that she wanted to go to public high school. And she that was a goal for her. And so we ended up moving her in in eighth grade so that there was a softer transition than just the abruptness of ninth grade. But her faith is her own and she's strong. And yeah. uh, you know, we we we're we've been real intentional around that tr- the transition into being a young lady and how we kind of can usher her into the waters of womanhood, you know, mm. and we did kind of a big event and uh we involved members of our tribe, but then also significant voices in her life just to speak life. So she has louder voices than the voices of her peers in her own head. And yeah, yeah, she's she's really involved at church and that's been cool. I think the biggest thing, if there's one thing that we've learned that is um, worthy of sharing, it's it's not being intimidated when there are voices in her life telling her good things that aren't you. Mm -hmm. And in fact, being happy like that she respects other women in our church and other women that Maybe say the same thing you've said a thousand times, but being okay with the fact that they're coming from someone else and just nodding your head and not and resisting the urge to say, I told you so, I think, <laughs> and just and championing that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like I would be curious to know what you guys would tell us. <laughs> what What advice do you have to give us? Oh, we have, I have, I have no advice at all other than just... <laughs> Lord have mercy on me. Yes. You know, it's so weird parenting. It's like you work harder at it than anything you ever have. Mm, yes. And yet there's no way to do it where you don't wound your children. Yeah. You know, yeah, you really think, what are they going to be sharing to their psychologist in 20 yeah. years? Right? There's yeah. no version of the Comer family that doesn't involve needing a good therapist in 10 years. Come on. <laughs> you know? Yes. So um, at I the same time, I've seen that. you though, you have your kid reading books and going through them with them. And yeah. Yeah. you guys are very intentional. Yeah, yeah, but intentionality does not, um, it, it does not cancel out wounding. So, yeah, I think I'm a really intentional dad. We have, I'm doing this like massive three year mm-hmm. initiation right to manhood. My boy is about to start mm-hmm. with my second son. You We're shaved his life. head in the woods with shaved a bonfire. <laughs> exactly. All it's happening things. in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Shave his head in the wood, the community of men, fire, eight That's day amazing. road trip down highway one, camping, reading archetypal masculinity, psychology books, teaching spiritual disciplines. <laughs> We're going to like tour where the comers come from, start at my grandfather's grave, talk about the heritage of what it means That's to be amazing. a comer. It's pretty like, dang all, good. All the things, but that doesn't mm. cancel out me you know, being exhausted after a long, stressful day of work mm-hmm. and and yelling at him when he doesn't perform the way I want and harming his, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't totally. cancel that out. Yeah. And still at the end of the day, I think most parenting is about relational connection. Yeah. So the intentionality stuff is very dear to my heart, but you know, like every, again, we're opposite personalities. I'm like intentional to a fault which is part of that's like a control freak thing, which is sap, which sabotages parenting, you know, mm. but kids don't love to be control freaked by dad. <laughs> and, you know, you're probably on the other side where yeah. you need to move toward intentionality by just by personality. Totally. Yeah. Totally. I need to like relax, chill out and let things just be what they are. But you know? I do think like when our kids were little, my mom said, I, I remember I called her, it was probably Jude was like, you know, going from that. You, I'm sure you remember this when your babies were little. It was like, they're five days old. Then they're like a week old. Then it's like you go from weeks to months. And then it was yes. years, you know. And I remember. <laughs> Nowadays, like all the people measuring yeah. and like, they're 27 weeks. They're 27 months old. And I'm like. You only get to count yeah. to a year. Then it's, yeah, I know. But. I still remember my mom, I, I called her and I was like, mom, I'm like, what, how do you not get sad about these like milestones that you pass, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, I remember she just said, Tammy, if you are really present to the moment when your kids are in a season, then, then each season you'll be present to, and you won't look back at it with regret. You'll just have memories And, um, I feel like for, at least for me with teenagers, the, I, I would actually say for the last, you know, 10 years or something, cell phones are like the most, um, 
distracting, uh, destructive, destructive thing in parenting because you're not present to them. So like, so for me, I feel like realizing that if I can be present to them, I need to put my phone away. And even just doing that makes me more present to be with them and not have like the regrets of the past of like being like, man, I really missed it. Yeah. with Jude when he was struggling with that girl or when he was struggling with that class or whatever. I missed it just because I was half, like half with him and half on my phone. Such a good word. So, I mean, That's I so think. encouraging. Oh, good. Yeah. I mean, he's, I, we love, I actually love having teenagers. I think it's, Same. it's been fun, right? Like oh, dance really parties is. and yep. <laughs> he doesn't love the dance parties, but <laughs> we do. I mean, well, you probably have rhythm. You, that, that does help. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, we go to weddings and Jenny's, I'm like, she loves dancing so much. And like, I want to serve her in love and be a kid. <laughs> and I just, it's not my space. Like I'm, find me the coffee, you know, and yes. I'm with you, Joe Mark, you know, I, but I want to dance. And then she just looks at me like, you're doing this wrong the whole time. No, and I'm like, I, I tried it's, to a, it's a look of pity. <laughs> Here's the worst part. We're at this wedding in and and she they had did some one of those dances that everybody knows. You know what I mean? It's like not the oh. electric slide in our day, you know? Yeah. So they all she all runs off to do it. And I'm like, Sam, I'm, like, I'm not gonna do it. But then someone else took pity and was like, hey, you should do this. I'm like, I'm not doing it. But then I ended up trying and and and, and then And I didn't know it was because I was in the so middle. She was of off the in the cluster group. with the cool kids. And you know, then she left someone me was like, the, Oh, Jenny, I think you left Levi behind. And yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh. And so like ran and I just felt bad. It's a real thing. Yeah. So <laughs> But dance party with the kids at home, that's good. Yeah. Are you guys still doing the big c- cookie uh, every Friday night? Ooh, I don't, how do you know about that? Yes, uh, most You of the wrote time. about it in your book, John Mark. <laughs> in the summer, it's ice cream. Is it in the book? Oh, it's okay, in the it's book. In the book. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah, it's a pazuki, a big pazuki with a winter. whole thing. That's winter, mm. and then uh, summer is more like ice cream out by the fire pit. Yeah. Very Ooh. good. And how do you guys now? And you mentioned cell phones, and obviously we all realize it's like crack and messing all our brains up and doing terrible things to everything. But we're also communicating to people on it right now, and yes. there's the dichotomy, right? But yeah. um, what do you guys do with kids? Like, cause do your kids have phones? Do they have iPod touches? Mm. No, we. I don't know if this is terrible parenting or great, but um, you know, I've just I've gone down the rabbit hole on cell phones, social media, and people in general, but teenagers and specifically, and it's, it's pretty dark. So we just told our kids really early on, absolutely nothing until 16 at 16, you get a flip phone. So Jude is about to get one in a couple of weeks. And then at 18, you can have a smartphone with no social media and then social media, we would encourage you to never ever have it unless if you need it for your job. And if you decide to have it, um, the last three months before you go away for college or your gap year, so we can mentor you in how to not let this ruin you. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that is a good thing to do or a bad thing to do, but we just made that commitment early on. We informed our kids early so they could kind of emotionally prepare. Yeah. And the hardest, they've actually been great. The hardest part is just that their um, friends all have, their friends all yeah. have them and, and most of their friends with zero accountability structures. I mean, not even like no filters, filters or, I mean, when Jude yeah. went to middle school, we ended up pulling him out for all sorts of reasons, but sixth grade, I mean, he gets on this bus, 45 students or whatever. He's the only middle schooler without a smartphone, without full access to the internet. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. what in the world is this doing to deform people? Oh, you know? Yeah. Well, and it's happening so much younger. I have a friend, one of our daughter's friends, um, she's nine and she was, our kids are, our younger kids are homeschooled, but um, she was saying that everyone in my class has a phone. So why can't I have a phone? And and so her mom was like trying to figure out what do I do? Because I mean, she's nine. Everyone literally has an actual phone with the internet. Yes. How do I do this? Um, and it's unbelievable. Just, Did either of you read that book, um, The Coddling of the American Mind? Mm-mm. No. Did you read that? I'll add that I do reference. hope at some point in the day you reference a book that I have read. That would be a big, big <laughs> well, well, yeah, No, but John Mark is is a different level. I've also seen. I, I meant to ask no, you about you, your highlight. You read a lot, and I have I have taken book recommendations. But when I see you, one of, you, one of when our I see favorite you. one of our favorite books was from you. I got a Hidden Life of Trees from him. Oh no way! Oh, yeah. I love that book. It's a good yeah. one. Yeah. 
great. Thank you, Holly Furtick. She told us about that mm. one. Uh, but you have a highlighting. When I see you mark up your books, I'm like, I always need to ask him because it is like a beautiful mind, the way you get in there and highlight <laughs> and write. And is there a system to that? Because that is, you, just, all, you just, should do a YouTube walkthrough. He was a schizophrenic, I believe. So uh, <laughs> I'm just saying when I see, like you, you know, I always screenshot whenever you put on stories, like the books you're reading or like, it'll be like, oh, it was a light day reading at the monastery when I was hanging out with Friar Tuck and, you know, <laughs> Bill Bo Baggins. And it's like all these pages that you've marked up. And I'm like, dang it. I never even been to a monastery, nor do I know where one is. <laughs> that is so great. Oh, I do love me in my monastery. I'm not, that's not a joke. I'm not going to lie. Okay. Awesome. My, yes, I read, I read a fair bit and you actually have gotten quite into reading yeah. recently. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, point is there's this book called the American mind. It's fantastic. You should read it. There's a um, chapter in there where they summarize this study from the university of Virginia, secular study. This is a secular book. And uh, it's a sociological study on the effect of social media on, actually, it's, I'm sorry, it's not on social media, but there are so, implications to social media. It was a study on, a, this is a little controversial, but it's, it's science, um, on <laughs> aggression in men and women. And the basic conclusion was that it's a myth that men are more aggressive than women, hmm. that women are just as aggressive as men, but hmm. stereo, but as a general rule, statistically speaking, men display aggression differently than women display aggression. So men display aggression more uh, uh, explicitly through violence or force, you know, or verbal attack, you know? So if a man has a problem with another man, this is, a, this is a stereotype, but it's based on a large kind of data population. A man might punch the other man or yell at the other man or have conflict with the other man. Women tend to display aggression through, they, they had very good language, I can't remember, but through basically subtle um, relational patterns of exclusion. Mm -hmm. So kind of very past, very implicit, very Snubbing. Passive, Snubbing. Yeah. kind of who's in, who's out, kind of like finding very yeah. subtle relational ways to exclude women from the end circle, but so it's actually an aggressive power wow. play move. Wow. And then they had this, so th that the study was on aggression. That's interesting. Then they applied it to teenagers and social media. And they basically said, if you wanted to destroy an entire generation of young adolescent boys, you'd put a gun in their front right pocket. If you wanted to destroy an entire generation of adolescent girls, you'd put Instagram in their front right pocket. Hello. Ooh. Wow. Because it, it basically just enables that behavior. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a, we have a firstborn son, you have a firstborn daughter. I hear these stories of like girls in tears because one of their photos didn't get liked by one of their friends. Like it's yes. that level of subtlety and literally in tears. Yeah. Um, you know, so the, yeah. the anxiety, the neurosis, the comparison, the body, I mean, mm -hmm. the stuff, I don't know when this episode will release, but just a couple of days ago that, you know, study was leaked from Facebook and Instagram. That was this deep internal study on women and body image issues. And that emphatically proves what all of us know to be true based by common sense that social media is destroying young women's body, body images, you know, yeah. and creating massive neurosis for young women in particular. And, uh, and they know it and it's literally built that way. Yeah. So, you know, so no, our kids don't have any social media. <laughs> yeah, there you that's go. amazing. That's, that's good so stuff. awesome. Well, and that's not judgment on parents that do. That's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. you ask what we personal, do. That's personal what we convictions. Do. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Um, John Mark, before we, I mean, this has been lovely, honestly, and Tammy and, and I, we could probably go two more hours and still, I feel like we, at this point we'd be like, just ready to, we'd be keep telling the waiter to come back because we're not ready to even order our mains yet. Yeah, I feel like we need, we need to have dinner. This yeah. needs to turn this, into This does feel like dinner. We will have to make that happen yeah. in real life. Yeah, well, if yeah, you guys do any would. trips to your Portland campus, come, you know, come come over to our hundred percent or meet up in LA or somewhere we, we, we cross paths along the way. But um, I do want to talk about this new book, Live No Lies. You just released this. Uh, beautiful book, beautiful. What is the story on the cover? I always like to hear the behind the scenes on the art. Um, okay, the only behind the scenes on the art is the book is built around this ancient Christian paradigm from the desert fathers and mothers of the three enemies of the soul, the world, the flesh, and the devil. So that's the wireframe of the book. There's three parts. And each of those parts has like an image, a triangle, this kind of odd shaped circle and a square. And that cover is actually a blow up of those images overlapping. You can't mm. tell, but that's. John Mark, for the person listening who's going um, uh, with their hand up in the air saying, uh, what do you mean by desert fathers and desert mothers? Uh, for the, I'm, I'm curious 
for, to hear you for the person who's going, hey, I love Jesus. Uh, Paul, I know. Silas, I know. Desert Fathers, I do not know. <laughs> okay, so, so here, well, let's just go book recommendation because that's just, that's love language. So you can read my book. That, that's fun. But there's a book that I absolutely love that I want you to read so bad mm-hmm. called Water from a Deep Well by mm-hmm. Gerald Sitzer, who is a professor at Whitworth. And it's beautiful. Eugene Peterson wrote the foreword for it. And it's basically a tour through church history. He divides church history into about 12 phases. And in each one, he gives you like the best of Christian spirituality Mm -hmm. through that stage of church history and kind of this, this wealth, these riches that we have in the Christian tradition to draw from. So he starts with the martyrs. And he ends with uh, kind of missionaries. And he just goes through these 12 phases over two millennia. And there's a great chapter in there on the desert fathers and mothers that you, and you don't have to read the whole book. You could just read, just read certain. Yeah. You could just read a chapter if you want what, what they are though. But yes. What period are we roughly talking? So we're talking kind of late two hundreds to 400. So basically a um, couple hundred, the first couple AD? hundred. Are we talking AD? AD. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, exactly. So the basic story is, you know, for almost 300 years, The way of Jesus, which later comes to be called Christianity, is is a persecuted minority in the Roman Empire. There's literally a state-sponsored genocide where the government is trying to eradicate by violence anybody that identifies as a Christian. And um, slowly, it doesn't work. The way of Jesus, the gospel, is so compelling that hundreds of thousands of people are coming to faith in Jesus, knowing it will likely cost them their life or their livelihood. And it spreads through the Roman Empire to the point that eventually the Roman Empire has to reverse course because now the persecuted minority is a political majority. So they legalize the way of Jesus. This is Constantine. This is Constantine. Yeah, three. I mean, I have to Google it. Three something. But the downside to what happens then. So now all of a sudden this thing that was violently persecuted is now like socially acceptable and even popular. And the problem with that is now widespread kind of compromise and complicity comes into the church as the church is now it's which is this is the western problem since then and really the american problem right now so there were different responses to this one response was a group of people that they didn't call themselves the desert fathers and mothers we call them that now but there were these groups of thousands of really serious christians that left the cities of the Mediterranean Roman world, and they went out into the deserts, mostly of North Africa and what we would call Tunisia now, but also Syria, Palestine, went out into the wilderness, and they would form that this is where later monasteries came from, the monastic movement came out of this. They would build these little huts, and they'd have these tiny little villages with an Abba or an Ama, those were words for a father or a mother, and that they were, was an older, wiser kind of person of prayer. And they would just devote themselves to prayer, community, and doing good deeds. Mm-hmm. And they just gave us, if you want to read some of the best stuff on prayer, mm-hmm. on spiritual formation, on how to become a person of love, on wisdom that you will ever read from a Christian in your whole life, mm-hmm. go read. Their, their, their writings survive to this day. I mean, you're reading stuff from like, a bunch of my new book is all based on one of the Desert Fathers, this man, Evagrius of Ponticus, who wrote this book in 354, Give I want to say. It's a great title. It's, yeah, it's called Talking Back. The, the subtitle is Monastic Handbook for Combating Demons. That's the one. It is genius. That's wow. the book where we get the idea of the seven I That should have gone down here. Right. It's Yeah, and because you know this, Levi, book titles are not, are not copyrighted. So I could have named this 100%. Live No Lies, a monastic yes. handbook for combating demons. Yes. But It'd be pretty good. I don't think that would have helped sales. Instead, we went with Recognize and Resist the Three Enemies that Sabotage Your Peace. Those of you on uh, so YouTube... Good. Those of you on YouTube and on Access More Video can see it. Those of you on Spotify and podcast app uh, are you just have a new Imagine. Or you could go to Amazon and look up the cover yourself. And while you're there, click buy. Because this is a good book, John Mark. Thanks, Levi. Uh, maybe just for a few minutes, just kind of give us kind of basically the, the the premise here or what 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 are we going to... I've read it. I loved it. But for someone listening, what are they going to experience? Oh, gosh. Yeah, there's lots of conversations there. Um you know, the wireframe is again, the world, the flesh and the devil, but I take it through this very central paradigm of in Jesus, 
So the devil is this concept that, you know, if you're a Christian, you kind of believe in the devil, kind of, sort of, almost, not really. But Although, what, what is it, 60% now of uh, 18 to 28-year-old Christians aren't sure that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So it's hard to know what anybody who calls himself a Christian actually believes about anything, much less the devil. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, most Western people would just scoff at the idea of the devil, like as some pre-modern, pre-scientific, like, yeah, the devil, we believe in that and Thor's hammer and Santa Claus, you know? Right, right. Um, And, but for, there's no possible way to take Jesus seriously as a teacher without um, simultaneously taking the devil very seriously, because in Jesus, he's not a side character, he's central in Jesus' teaching in his character. I mean, I just read yesterday in the book of Acts, that Jesus went around healing all those oppressed by the devil. That was like the mission statement of Jesus. Wow. So it's central to Jesus' story. I mean, the first story you read about Jesus after his baptism is the story of his kind of fight with the devil in the wilderness. It's central to his teaching. It's central to the book of Acts, the New Testament. You cannot set it aside and take Jesus seriously as a teacher. But in Jesus' most in-depth teaching on the devil in John chapter 8, and then arguably in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, the story of his temptation in the wilderness with the devil, Jesus' primary uh, warning about the devil is about lies and deception. Jesus says, you know, calls the devil the father of lies as his Interesting line, when he lies, he speaks his native language. In context, that's the same passage in John where he says, you know, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, which if you reverse engineer that is kind of simultaneously saying that we're in bondage to lies. We're in bondage to deceptive ideas about reality that somehow enslave our mind and our body and our soul and our relationships and our society as a whole. So the book is really just this deep dive into the way the human brain is wired and the the role of lies or truth in our spiritual formation or deformation. And I I talk a lot about what psychologists call mental maps, uh, like this idea that I'm getting, you guys don't look like you're at your house, you're at the church or at some office somewhere. So I'm guessing you didn't use like the maps on your phone to get there this morning. No. I'm guessing you just, you have a mental map, a literal yes. one, like of how to get from your house or wherever you were before to the office. And if that mental map is true, meaning if it corresponds to reality, then you get in your car or, and whatever your bike, whatever you do. And, you know, 10 minutes later, 20 minutes later, you arrive at the office. If for some reason that mental map is off, if it's not true, if it doesn't correspond to reality, you end up lost in the mountains of Montana or or wherever, you know? And in in the same way that we have mental maps for how to get to the office or the gym or a coffee shop or a grocery store or church, we have mental maps for all of life, Mm -hmm. for how to do marriage, how to do parenting, Mm -hmm. how to do our phone, how to do sexuality, how to do money, how to do food, how to do entertainment. We have, we have a mental map that we think will lead us to call it the good life, call it happiness, uh, call it the kingdom of God in Christian language that we think will lead us to the life we ache for. But the, the tragedy, the, the beauty of the human person and the tragedy of the human person is our capacity to believe in things that are not true. The, the positive side to that is our capacity for imagination That's the result of all art, creativity, Mm -hmm. entrepreneurship, business, and risk and faith. The the tragic shadow side is our capacity to believe lies. Mm -hmm. And so if, and, you know, I talk a lot about this psychologist, M. Scott Peck, who we both love. We both read his book, reference one of them. In another book by him called People of the Lie, he has this basic theory of how people become evil Uh, meaning just pervaded by evil at some deep level. And his basic answer is they, by believing lies, that you have some kind of an experience, good or bad, traumatic or not, and some kind of an interpretation of that experience that is not true, that is a lie, that is a deceptive idea, comes into your mind. And if you start to live as if that is true, then tragically it becomes true. So uh, an all too common example would be If, you know, say you've been through a a relational wound, uh, whether it's with a boyfriend or girlfriend or marriage or divorce or uh, some kind of abuse or assault, you can you live through this traumatic relational experience. You can often then have a lie into your mind. Well, that's because I'm I'm unlovable now or I'm dirty now or nobody will ever love me or I'll be single the rest of my life or I I don't deserve to have a, a spouse or whatever it is, which is not true. But if you begin to live into that narrative as if it is true, 
then, then the tragedy is if you live for 10 years of your life, as if you're somebody who's dirty, unlovable, men don't like you or women don't like you or always be single or nobody will ever. If you live into that narrative long enough, it will actually form you into the kind of person where what started out as a lie actually becomes true. And so much of our discipleship to Jesus and our formation is about identifying what are these demonic lies that have come to like infiltrate our consciousness and how do we identify, recognize them and then resist them in order to, to, to get freedom from bondage to, to, to lies. Wow. Wow. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That is That's a it. short telling <laughs> of a great book, Live No Lies. I mean, this thing is... Uh, 300 plus pages. You got so many footnotes. <coughs> but me. they're short pages because we write like a blog. So yeah, you know, that's true. Like, that's and again, the book. spacing, <laughs> it's it's very readable. You All your books are very user-friendly. I love how you start every section and every, every chapter with kind of a cheat sheet crash course on what's about to come in the next section. Uh, as, 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 as they all are very, very well-written, uh, you can tell you love words. Tammy, I'm so glad that you came to join us on the show today. Thank you. Thanks for including me. So kind. Honestly, you two are a bright light. Um, You're making a difference. I I hear and know people all around the world who are constantly talking about your ministry. I know you're encouraging a lot of people in your church and in the world, but also I know pastors and leaders are encouraged by you. So keep going. I can't wait to see what this next season looks like. Can't wait to see what comes of this hair, dude, John Mark, because it is getting long. It's a, it's a full on midlife crisis. <laughs> I resigned from my awesome. job. I'm growing out my hair. I'm fantasizing about buying a Ford truck. I just Honestly, I say, do it. Do I say, it. do all the things you're like, it reminds me of like a, like an Italian mobster. It's just slicked back and it's getting long it's back It's terrible. There. I, I know I wake up every morning and know that I'm going to cringe at photographs of this hair, but I'm going to grow it to the end of our sabbaticals. So that's like the end of basically till next summer. So it's, it's going. It may be as long as Tammy's by then. We're halfway there. Although Tammy, I think if your hair was straightened, it would probably hit your feet. It's true. It's very long. Our Beautiful. son, or actually our oldest son has been here. Well, we have overstayed our welcome. We're going to get you on to your day. Uh, But let's do this again. And God bless you guys and all you put your hand to. May this sabbatical be replenished. We'd love to have dinner next time you guys are in town. Uh, Yes. Our casa, casa, love to have you. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for listening. And be sure to swing by LeviLusco.com to see what's going on in our world. And make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. In the meantime, we would love to connect with you on social media. Jenny and Levi Lusco, out.